Swimoutlet.com delivers the best online shopping experience. With an extensive selection and the lowest prices, you're guaranteed to find the product you need. Here's what you get. Free shipping on all orders over $49. Free one to two day shipping on all orders over $99. All orders placed by 6 p.m. ship out the same day. Shop at Swimoutlet.com, the web's most popular swim shop. This is a very special morning swim show. I'm here at the ASCA World Clinic here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm here with a guy who probably needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. It's Gary Hall Sr., who's here, you know, kind of in a new role for yourself. You've been a, a coach for a relatively short period relative to, you know, your swimming career. Tell us how long you've been coaching down there at the race club. Uh, Jeff, I started down there coaching in 2005, a little bit, and then after the 2008 trials, uh, when Mike Bottom went to Michigan and, um, you know, I, we didn't have a coach and I had kind of made make a decision. Well, do I want to pick up and, and try to do this or just kind of let it go? And I decided that uh, it would be something I enjoy doing and, and I should give it a try. And, and our focus, my focus wasn't on coaching a team in the traditional sense, uh, but to focus on the technical side and, and try to improve swimming technique. Uh, it's turned out to be really a, a, a really a wonderful and, and great experience because um, uh, you know I didn't know it at the time, but there's really a kind of an unmet need in in, in America in the world to, to focus on that aspect of swimming. Uh, we, coaches are great about getting our swimmers physically ready and in shape. Uh, tremendous programs, but spend very little time on the technical side. And as we all know, the technique in swimming is so critical. And the faster you get, the more important technique relative to power becomes. Do you think they're not focusing on the technique because they're the, the teams are such large numbers and they don't have the time to focus on it? I think that's probably the main reason. You know, coaches are like watching over a flock of sheep. And when one goes to the bathroom, they've got to herd them back into the, to the flock. Uh, you, you see everyone, but you see no one at the same time. You're trying to make sure they make intervals. You're seeing what their times are. But it's, you really have to focus on the details, the little things. And that's why we don't ever take on more than a few swimmers at a time. And we do a lot of time one-on-one. -on -one. You really have to get underwater. You have to see from above, from front, from the back. You have to really look at the, the tiny little details and swimming is kind of an unforgiving sport. If you do something wrong, the, the water really has no mercy. Uh, the drag factors in swimming come into play at a very low speeds. So getting people to do the little things right really makes a difference in their time. It's been very gratifying because you can help people a lot without them working any harder, just being more conscious of the little details, getting them to do them. And, and it does take work to do them right. You, yeah. you, they don't just happen. You have to make them happen, but by doing that, uh, they become much better swimmers. What's it been like for you to, to see the sport on the other side now as a coach? Well, for one thing, I have to tell you, I've learned more about swimming as a coach than I ever did as a swimmer or as an administrator or running the race club or, or the world team in Phoenix or the Phoenix Swim Club. Uh, different roles, but when you're coaching and you're telling somebody what they should or shouldn't do, you know, you better be pretty sure that you're right because I just hate telling somebody to do the wrong thing. And, and there is a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people that are going on what they did 20 years ago or things they used to believe were true but have really been proven not to be. Uh, so it's made me think more about this sport. And before I tell somebody that I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that what I give them is good advice and that it's going to help them. One of the great greatest coaches ever in swimming was one of the coach kind of helped you to your Olympic success, Doc Councilman. Is there any philosophies that he had when he was coaching you in Indiana that you feel still apply today, today that you can use? Yeah, a lot of what Doc coached um, is still being applied today. I think his book, even today, is extremely relevant. Not everything he, he got right, but what I loved about Doc was he was really the first coach who really thought about from a scientific standpoint physics physiology you know 
anatomy. He put all of the, the, the science and, and really tried to come up with good reasons why you should do one thing or another. Prior to that, you know, people kind of copied others or they did it based on the experience of what they thought worked or didn't work. And, um, you know, he was a pretty remarkable guy. He was so knowledgeable. He was a jack of all trades. And he, and he was a PhD in physiology, but his, his knowledge went way beyond that. He was really a, a brilliant psychologist uh, in addition to having tremendous knowledge in, in physiology, anatomy, physics. Um, and he surrounded himself with a lot of brilliant scientists. You can get too much science in swimming. I, I right. think there's a balance that's important. If you, if you just listen to science, they don't have the practical knowledge and they don't have the experience to know what's really right or wrong. If you just listen to the experience side, they miss out on some really important physical or scientific principles that may help them. So I think the balance is really important. And you talked about him, you know, knowing a lot about the psychology of swimmers. That had to have helped, especially for college age swimmers, you know, who are really kind of at the peak of their career and, you know, trying to really be at that top of the mountain like you guys were. And, and, and I always say this about Doc. He was probably the greatest sports psychologist that I've ever met in any field. Um, when you consider that Indiana at those, in those years, if you looked at it as a country, it was the fifth fastest country of the world. <laughs> in the Olympics, we would have probably gotten more medals than, uh, well, we would have won more than most countries. But he had a team of thoroughbreds of really great athletes all of whom had egos, all of whom had different personalities. Some of them, like Mark Spitz and you know those that remember Mark, he was a challenge to coach, a phenomenally talented athlete, but you really had to get into his head to get him to work. And Doc handled John Kinsella and, and, and Mike Stam and, and, uh, you know, and me and Mark all differently, but made each of us feel as if we were like his pet, like his favorite. That's hard to do. That's very, very hard to do. And, and he somehow melded the chemistry of the team so that it all, you know, gelled together. And that's what made the Indiana teams, I think, so successful. Not yeah. just that we had the talent, but he could make the talent work. Yeah, I think it's really hard to do, especially in this day and age, because, you know, so much in college swimming is focused on the team result and as, as such a lot of those swimmers get lost in the shuffle and you get a lot of those swimmers who um, you know probably don't reach their full potential because the coaches aren't aren't able to really work with them on an individual level like they may need but um, yeah Indiana definitely one of the great college um, legacies in the 70s won six in a row and you were part of those and then moved on to the Olympics um, 68 and 72 Olympics did very well, won a few medals, and we're here up at the tail end of the 40th anniversary of those 72 Olympics. I mean, looking back 40 years, obviously that was the Olympics where Mark Spitz won yeah. his seven gold medals, and you were a part of a few of those races. What what single memory stands out for you the most? Well, I think. And the Olympics in general, you, you, you know, it'll always be known as the Olympic of the, of the uh, Israeli tragedy and the, and the massacre of the athletes by the Palestinians, which changed the Olympics forever. It was kind of the Olympic version of 9-11. Right. And, you know, at the time, we thought that was the end. We, we didn't think the Olympics would go on. And what happened, it was fortunate that swimming had ended. Uh, but when that happened, it froze everybody. You know, we were just stunned. We were just sitting in our rooms, speechless, depressed, thinking, that's it, you know. It started in 18, 1896 and it ended today in 1972. But they made the right decision. They, they had a moratorium, we had a funeral service, we all went to the stadium and um, paid tribute to the Israelis that had died. And the next day was, okay, the Olympics must go on, the games right. must go on. And they did. Uh, admittedly different, you know, at one time, if you made the Olympic team, your parents could walk into the village and, you know, go around and see athletes, and it was fun to be part of that experience. From that point on, it was, it's Fort Knox. You can't right. get in there, you can't get out of there unless you're credentialed, and you, you better not forget your credentials or you're not getting back in. The security has changed uh, immensely. It's driven the cost of the Olympics up tremendously. 
Um, it doesn't have the same kind of openness feel that it used to, but it's gone from being relatively big in 72 to a huge event today. And uh, so it has to be treated differently. When you look at, let's say, your silver medal in the 200 fly that you won in 72, do you look at it and think about that race, but also think about the fact that, you know, that, that whole Olympics was dampened by, by that whole attack? You know, I don't. I think of, uh, as you look back, you take a different view of your Olympic experience than you do at the time. Um, 1972, even though I silver medaled in the 200 fly, it was a bit of disappointment because I was, I should have gold medaled in the 400 IM and I didn't. I had one bad swim in three Olympics and it was just a day that I woke up and I just didn't have it. And then I think I could have pulled it out if I had been able to keep my composure. It was the hardest day of my life and I just panicked. Ended up fifth. I went out way too fast. But the worst thing is I destroyed myself because I got so nervous I couldn't eat. And when I couldn't eat, I, I knew I wouldn't swim well. I carried a lot of burden from that for years. Now I look back and I think it might have been the greatest thing happened to me because it, left, it leaves you with a kind of a drive. And I don't mean to sound like winning the gold medal is anything less than a, an incredible journey. But when you don't win, it's like, okay, now what? Now I got to do something. And it leaves you a little bit hungry in your life to do something. And I'm not certain I would have been the same person had I won that I, that I didn't. But I don't really think now about winning and losing. I think back and think, wow, what an amazing experience it was just to be there. Yeah. And to experience that three times, each of them very different. And how lucky I was to be a part of it. And now I look at the medals and think, that's just like frosting on the cake. I was, you know, obviously I was really proud. And then in 76, when I got to carry the flag in this opening ceremony, that was really the highlight of my career. That was the greatest honor that I achieved. Yeah, I was going to ask you what you thought was the highlight, and I was instantly thinking you were going to say carrying the flag, because, I mean, you're, you're basically representing your nation across all sports, not just swimming. It's, you know, we all are proud of being American, I hope, and we want to have a moment where we can really ex exemplify that and uh, live that. And for me, that moment was the moment where I could be most proud of my country. And the way I was selected, it was a, a, a really an honor by being selected by my peers, my teammates. Um, but to, to carry that Stars and Stripe and to walk in and, and hear 80,000 people cheer for you, it, it was a goosebump moment. And it, it's one that I, I just always look back and I think that was the highlight of my, my career. Not in the pool, walking 400 meters around that track in Montreal holding that red, white, and blue. It was, it was a great feeling. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to the 76 Olympics in a minute. I want to talk about 72, obviously, as I said, was the big uh, meet for Mark Spitz. That 200 fly, and a lot of people had kind of thought you, would, you wouldn't win the gold medal. Um, coming into that race, knowing what Mark had, had, you know, had been expected to do, it was, that was his first of his seven gold medals. Um, you know, did were you thinking, you know, I'm I want to be the one to kind of stop this history? Were you thinking at all of Mark Spitz, or were you kind of in this bubble? I'm just Gary Hall, and I'm going to swim the best race I can. No, you you can't be in a race with Mark Spitz and not think about him. But anyone at that level doesn't really think they're going to get beat by anybody. And if you do, you're probably not going to make it to that level. So yeah. I never relinquished that race to Mark. Mark was a better swimmer than me, and he proved that. More talented. But the year before that, we had almost tied to the hundredth of a second at 200 fly. The year before that, I'd beaten him. We'd always had close races. And in 72, he made a breakthrough. He really went to a different level, and he left the rest of the world behind, including me. But as I trained, I had three events there. I had the 200 IM, 400 IM, and the 200 fly. The 200 fly was the first day. It was the first event of the first day. And Mark was interesting. If Mark started a meet really well, he was unstoppable. But if he had a bad swim or somebody beat him in the first event, that whole event for him would have been different. He would not have gotten what he did, and he would not have gone on to swim the way he did. But once he got on a roll, he was incredible. Um, he deserved and earned those seven gold medals. But that 200 fly set him up for a great limit. I ended up swimming a second faster than my best time. I was way behind him, but I still swam a smart race. I didn't let him take me out. He went out fast, 
And I knew if I tried to hang with him, I wouldn't. Yeah. So I hung back a little bit, and I actually was pulling up, but it was too late. I couldn't catch him. I still was happy. I was really pleased that I got the time I did. And I really didn't, yes, I would have loved to won, but I really didn't think about that. I was trying to achieve a certain time. I did that yeah. time, and that was what, what made me happy. And to win the medal was just extra. Yeah, and then the 76 Olympics, I mean, the United States winning 12 of 13 events. I mean, just absolute dominance. I mean, to be a part of that, I mean, it had to be a real big sense of pride knowing that the United States was so good. I mean, that's that's something that hasn't been seen since, that, you know, that any country can be so dominant. Well, that, uh, you know, next to carrying the flag, another proud moment is, is um, what those men did that year. And the women, too. I don't want to slight the women right. because... I'd have to say if you picked out a single event that was the most remarkable, not just for those Olympics, maybe if the people would appreciate the odds they were up against, the women's 400 free relay at the end of that Olympics to beat the East Germans when we, they knew, you know, our women knew they were doping and cheating and they said, we're going to beat them anyway. And they did. And, and they all swam way above their heads to do that. But the men's side was just an incredible experience uh, being part of that. Uh, winning every gold medal but one, sweeping, I think, six out of the 11 individual events, uh, setting a world record in, in every event we won. It, w it was an incredible experience of team building and how a team can affect each of our own experience and performance. Out of the, I don't know, 25 or 26 swimmers, there, were there was only one swimmer on that team who did not achieve his personal best time. And it wasn't just by a couple of tenths. Remember, the trials were only five weeks before that. Mm -hmm. Nobody then or nor now really swam through the trials. You shaved, you peaked, you went for it. It's the only way you're going to make it. And then five weeks later or four weeks later, we come back, and everybody dropped their time by a second, two seconds. And John Neighbor in the 100 backstroke to beat Roland Mathis went from 56 high at the trials to 55.4. Who does that yeah, in yeah, one month? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, swims like that were just beyond what we ever thought we were we could do. And, and the only reason that happened was because we were swimming for each other. We weren't swimming as individuals. We were swimming for each other. And we had a little ritual we went through every day. We carried the flag and a broom over to the, the pool, arm in arm, chanting, sweep, sweep, sweep. We cheered for each other. We... we um, we just hung together as a team, and, and, and it showed. I mean, that, I don't know if that'll ever be duplicated. Well, it won't because because of that, they, they stopped taking three swimmers. Right. They only took two after that. But just, just the dominance of just winning every single thing, event yeah. after event after event. And we weren't expected to. We were expected to win our share, but we weren't expected to dominate. Not in that way. Yeah. Uh, 20, I think I, I may have the numbers right, but I think it was 20... Eight out of 35 possible medals. Yeah. There were 30. There were, there were 11 individuals and two relays. And there were, out of those possible medals, we the rest of the world won six or seven medals, and the U.S. won 27 or 28. That's pretty amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Now, how old were you at the 76 Olympics? Well, they called me the old man of the t the sea. I was 24. I was almost 25. Yeah, I mean, which is like a baby today. Yeah, today. I mean, that's, that's just a, the start. That's I the mean, start. I mean, how were you? I mean, at that time, obviously 24, 25. You're out of college. I mean, the opportunities then, you didn't ha that the opportunities that people have now, you didn't have then. So, no. what was it like for you to be able to continue on past college and still compete at a high level? Well, first of all, I have to tell you, I was in medical school. I took a year off. I took nine months off. I didn't even take a full year off. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it if my wife, Mary, thank you, Mary, had not supported me uh, because there was no way of financially supporting yourself. Uh, I actually worked my, my way through medical school coaching and made a little bit of help pay tuition. And then I decided, you know what? I didn't win the gold. I still feel like I've got a little bit left in me. And remember, in those days, you graduated from college, you were done. That was it. Nobody swam past college. That yeah. was the end of your career. And no real professional opportunity to, to continue. So I was pretty, uh, pretty, considered pretty old at 24 to be even trying for the Olympics. And yet I, I went to a indoor nationals in 75 when I was training very little. 
and I swam three of my best times. And I said, you know what? Maybe I'm not finished yet. Maybe I still got. And I didn't know I wasn't Jeff Cummings and swimming at 38, almost best times. But you know, Dara Torres has rewritten the books on how oh, long yeah. you can swim, and uh, others have too. Well, for all that. You're now an inductee into the USOC Hall of Fame. Has to obviously been a really big honor for you to be recognized that way. Well, having Gary uh, be inducted there was um, was I guess the pride of, proudest thing you can ex have as a father. And I'd, I'd have to say it surpassed even winning his gold medals, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I always said it's like watching your son pitch a perfect game in the World Series, you know, or daughter. Uh, but being there just in uh, July at the uh, or June at the um, Olympic Hall of Fame and see Gary get inducted in a very, very elite crowd of swimmers. I think there's only 15 swimmers in the entire history of the modern Olympics that have been inducted into the Hall of Fame, the Olympic Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, it was really something. And to see him there and how proud we were and proud he was to be in such elite company, it was, it was really special. And for you to be able to you know, be able to pass that on, your talents, too. I mean, not a lot of, I don't think there's really any father-son Olympic champions that we could count ever in the Olympics. I mean, that's that's a really great feat to be able to, you know, be able to pass it on and, and be able to support him in that way. Well, you know, uh, I love swimming, and, I, and I, I'm passionate about the sport. And we had our, oh, we had six children, and, and Gary was the oldest, and they all swam. And they weren't all Olympic caliber, obviously. Some were really good, and some were okay, and some weren't as good. But you know what? They all loved the sport, and they all got something out of it. And I think Gary had the hardest job because, or maybe Richard, my middle son, because, you know, they had a pretty tough act to follow. Yeah. And when you're starting them out in their career, you don't think about that. You just you don't even think they're going to make the Olympics. You hope they get across the pool, and that all. And then later you say, wait a minute, maybe I put them in a tough situation here. <laughs> but it's too late. You can't turn back. I do it all over again. Um, but I have to say that it puts an inordinate amount of pressure without even trying to. You just it just is there. And so for him to overcome the pressure of making the Olympics and then having to you know, follow that tradition is very, very tough. And uh, to say he did an amazing job of, of just putting that aside and being Gary and, and yeah. being himself and, and kind of added a lot of personality to the sport, I think. Absolutely. I think he definitely brought a lot of, like you said, personality that um, will definitely make him, like you, one of the most memorable people to ever grace this sport, Gary. I think it's, it's a great it's a great tribute to the Hall family that, um, you know, not just you, but Gary Jr. have uh, really graced the sport in so many ways. Thanks so much for taking time to sit and talk with us and um, enjoy the rest of learning more about being a coach here in Las Vegas. I will, and it's fun to learn. It's always, you never stop learning. So, Jeff, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. I appreciate you having us on the show. Our pleasure. Show. So that's uh, Gary Hall Sr. joining us here from the Aspen Convention. I'm Jeff Cummings, and thanks for watching.